You know, I like Spurgeon. <laughs> Sometimes he just hits it right, right dead on. Have you ever had a, or heard of a gotta-do list? You know, the, not a honey-do list, not a ought-to-do list, but a gotta-do list. <laughs> now, you probably haven't quite put it into the ter terms quite like that. You see, a honey-do list would be a person that, you know, is in a marriage relationship, you know, and that your honey or your wife, you know, wants you to do something or whatever it may be, and so they call it the honey-do list, you know, and, you know, it's better to, you know, uh, attract someone with honey than it is to just tell them, do this or else. Well, in Christianity, unfortunately, we have a gotta-do list, or some people have a gotta-do list. Now, I don't personally believe in a gotta-do list, but haven't you ever heard people that are out there telling you what you gotta do? I mean, if you really listed it all out about what everybody says, then you'd have this outrageous long gotta-do list, you know? And it's always interesting to me because the gotta-do list over the years keeps getting longer and longer and longer. You gotta go to church, you gotta go on Sunday, you gotta go on Monday, you gotta go on Saturday. <laughs> you just gotta, gotta, you know? I mean, the gotta family ought to have taken out a patent on their own name. You know, you gotta speak in tongues, you gotta not speak in tongues. You gotta have this, you gotta have that. You gotta be this, you gotta be that. Boy, you know, if I kept track of all the gottas I'd heard all my life, it would just drive me nuts. Because there's so many people out there that got to do something, but they don't get to go with what God has said to do that he will do for you. Because the reality is, is that God made a covenant. God made an agreement. God did something that was so different and so unique that it really kind of messed up people that they didn't know what to do with their got to do's anymore. Because it was something that he said he would do as opposed to what we got to do. Because people always want to make you do something as opposed to be something. See, Jesus, when he came, recognized that the people couldn't do what the got to do's wanted them to do. He said, look, I'm going to take care of the got to's and you just do what I say, which was to accept what he was going to do for us so that we could be with him and become like him. Because in that way, it would be God who would receive the credit. It would be God who would receive the glory. It would be God who would be doing it and not ourselves. Because what we say and what we've read is, it's by grace you were saved and that not of yourselves, lest you should be able to boast, but that it was a gift of God given to you to save you from something you couldn't do. So every time you had a gotta do, you couldn't do. So there was frustration. There was anxiety. There was striving. There was anxiousness because not only could you not do what the gotta do's were saying, but the got to do's couldn't do it either. So Jesus came and showed us that the gotta do list just doesn't work because he said, it is God who has at work, both doing to will of his good pleasure, that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. What we do is we yield to him and let him work in us to accomplish through us the purpose of God for us so that we would be an example of his grace, of his work, and of his salvation being worked on us, being worked in us, and being worked through us. Now, you could have your gotta do list, you know, and you could try to make someone gotta do what you think they gotta do, but because they can't do it, I think you're gonna get frustrated over your gotta do list because your gotta do list just isn't gonna get accomplished. But what God said he would do, he did, and he has accomplished. So, in Spurgeon, he puts it kind of eloquently, and he puts it kind of poetically, but let's see what he would say. He has commanded his covenant forever. The Lord's people delight in the covenant itself. 
it is an unfailing source of consolation to them so often as the Holy Spirit leads them into its banqueting house and waves its banner of love. They delight to contemplate the antiquity of that covenant, remembering that before the day star knew its place or planets ran their round, the interests of the saints were made secure in Jesus. It is peculiarly blessing to them to remember the sureness of the covenant. While meditating upon the sure mercies of David, they delight to celebrate it as signed and sealed and ratified in all things and ordered well. It often marks their hearts the Boy, when, it, when Spurgeon wants to really get into some good sentences, it often makes their hearts dilate with joy to think of its immutability as a covenant which neither time nor eternity, life nor death, shall ever be able to violate, a covenant as old as eternity and as everlasting as the rock of ages. They rejoice also to feast upon the fullness of this covenant, for they see in it all things provided for them. God is their portion, Jesus their companion, the Spirit their comforter, earth their lodge, and heaven their home. They see in it an inheritance reserved and entailed to every soul possessing an interest in its ancient and eternal deed of gift. Their eyes sparkled when they saw it as a treasure trove in the scriptures. But oh, how their souls were gladdened when they saw in the last will and testament of their divine kinsmen <laughs> that it was bequeathed to them also. More especially, it is the pleasure of God's people to contemplate the graciousness of this covenant. They see that the law was made void because it was a covenant of works and depended upon merit. But this they perceive to be enduring because grace is the basis, grace the condition, grace the strain, grace the bulwark, grace the foundation, grace the top stone. Literally, the framing, the foundation, and the roofing, and the structure thereof is grace. The covenant is a treasury of wealth, a granary of food, a fountain of life, a storehouse of salvation, a charter of peace, and a haven of joy. If you're saved in any other way than grace itself, then you find yourself with a gotta-do list that you're going to want to do because you're going to have to treat and try to make yourself do the things that you think you got to. And when grace comes into your heart and literally flows out of you to others, then the same grace you receive, the same mercy, the same forgiveness, the same kindness, the same gentleness, will flow out from you to extend the same grace to others likewise. Because, you see, if you have a gotta-do list, you're going to make others gotta-do too. But if you have grace in your heart, you're going to give grace for grace, mercy for mercy, forgiveness for forgiveness, and love for love. That is the covenant that God wants for us, that he's already done for us, that he accomplished in his son, and that he's giving to you. A permanent covenant that will endure forever, because it does extend grace to you as you extend grace to others. The beauty of it all is that <laughs> it kind of wipes out all your gottas and just lets you be who you are today to be who he's making you into become, which is the image of his own son.